Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for the latest episode of our series of conversations with people in the surface analysis community around the world. The guest we have for this episode started her career in France. She completed her PhD at Pierre and Marie Curie University in Paris in 2004. After her studies, she moved to New Jersey to join the Experimental Surface Science Condensed Matter Group at Rutgers University, where she is currently working as an assistant research professor. In her research, she specializes in exploring the electronic structure and morphology of surfaces and interfaces at the atomic and molecular scale. At the time of recording, she has over 70 publications to her name, and her current research areas include 2D organic layer growth, energy alignment in organic oxide interfaces, and the electronic structure of ionic liquids at interfaces. I'm thrilled to be joined today by Sylvie Rangan. Hi Sylvie, how are you doing? Hi Tim, very good, and you? I'm very well as well. So how's it been for you and the people at Rutgers during lockdown? Uh, well, it has been uh, a bit challenging, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, you know, if you uh, wear proper attire and uh, you can still work in the lab. So. Oh, it's great to hear that you can get back and work in the lab now. Yeah, now, now we can, yes. So. so was there a time when you had to close down and stop working completely? No, no. Actually, the university was closed for a while, uh, you know, but uh, we always have things to do, papers to write, proposals to write. We can get busy. Oh, well, that's the thing with science. As well as doing all the experiments, you've got to do the paperwork as well. You think you're doing science, but you're not. <laughs> well, speaking of doing science, Sylvia's joined us to share some of the recent work that she's been involved in, looking at the valence band of cyanoionic liquids using UPS and XPS. So, Sylvie, over to you. Okay, uh, so I'll try to share today a, a few interesting and recent results we've, uh, we've obtained on uh, cyanoionic liquids uh, using valence band photoemission spectroscopy. Uh, so first, uh, a little reminder about what ionic liquids are, right? So you're all familiar with what, uh, with uh, table salts, right? Uh, so this is an ionic solid. Uh, and uh, in ionic solids, you have basically have an alternation of, uh, in this case, uh, sodium uh, cation and um, uh, chlorine anions that are uh, packed together in a, in a uh, compact arrangement. Uh, so now if you replace uh, these small ions by uh, bulkier and larger um, ions, uh, such as these uh, molecular ions that I'm showing here, um, and in, in particular if these uh, molecular ions have internal degrees of freedom, then you cannot uh, obtain um, a crystal anymore, but you're obtaining something that's liquid at, temp at room temperature. So uh, these ionic liquids here have a, actually interesting properties. One of them is that they're conductive, and another one that's quite important for us is they have a low vapor pressure. So uh, with that, uh, we can actually put these uh, ionic liquids in our uh, UHV chamber and run photoemission experiments. So ionic liquids have um, numerous applications for technological uh, purposes. Um, the, and, and these applications use uh, either uh, their uh, uh, physical properties or their electronic properties. Well, in my case, I'm interested in learning more about the electronic properties of this uh, system. And this is particularly, particularly relevant if you want to uh, use them as electrolytes in, in, in some systems like fuel cells or batteries or things like that. So my main point is try to determine uh, what basically influences the electronic properties of ionic liquids and how does the choice of these ion pairs in ionic liquids change the electronic properties. So it turns out that a valence point photoemission spectroscopy is a very good tool to study the electronic structure of these, uh, uh, these systems. So here I am showing two valence band spectra uh, measured on this on one ionic liquid, liquid and I'm, I'm, I'm showing the, the um, the, the, the two ions, uh, schematic of the two ions here. And um, you can, these two valence band spectra have been measured at two different photon energy. Uh, on top, you have a UPS spectrum that's measured with an helium-2 line. And at the bottom, you have an uh, XPS valence band spectrum measured with aluminum K-alpha line. Uh, and so already, uh, you have nice uh, features in both spectra, but you can tell that 
uh, although we are probing the same density of states technically, uh, these spectra look very different. And this is because you have photoemission cross-section effects that are very strong. Um, so, uh, but this is actually quite helpful, these uh, cross-section effects. And for example, this allows you to uh, 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 validate uh, theoretical approaches, for example. So, like here we predict that the HOMO, the highest occupied molecular orbital for this ionic liquid, should be uh, situated on the anion part of this uh, liquid. And the anion, uh, indeed the HOMO, has uh, a strong S uh, sulfur 3p character and a strong nitrogen 2p character. And both these orbitals have a strong cross-section in XPS as opposed to UPS. And so you can see that explains why in XPS the HOMO is so prominent in the valence band photoemission spectrum. So it's quite useful to actually understand and uh, the nature and the origin of each molecular orbitals. So we can even go further and try to simulate uh, valence band spectra uh, for the systems. And for this, what we do is we calculate the ground state density of states of some uh, 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 of our system, and we weigh this uh, density of state with appropriate photoemission cross-section. And you have seen in the slide just before that this is actually, these cross-sections are actually quite important uh, in the spectra. Uh, so what I'm showing here is uh, experimental valence band spectra measured in UPS and in XPS. Uh, so this is a black curve. And uh, I'm comparing this experimental spectra to calculated uh, spectra that are calculated either for one pair of ions or for five pairs of ions. And um, the, uh, although these two um, calculated valence band spectra resemble pretty well the experimental uh, measurement. Uh, uh, as you can see, in fact, here, uh, taking into account the cross-sections into this calculation is very critical because of such large differences you have in the photoemission cross-section. But although these two calculations uh, are, are resemble the experimental spectrum, only the spectrum calculated for uh, large clusters uh, of five pairs of ions describes the, the finer details of the experimental spectrum. So, for example, uh, you can see that uh, the uh, edge of this uh, photo emission of this uh, the valence band feature here is aligned uh, much better with the calculated edge for uh, five pairs. Uh, similarly, you have a shoulder around minus five uh, eV uh, of binding energy uh, that appears only uh, when you have five pairs. So, so why is there such a difference between a calculation uh, for one pair and five pairs, and how does it help in understanding electronic um, structure in ionic liquids? So, um, an important problem in ionic solids or ionic liquids, right, is the magnum potential that is uh, as a result of the interaction of uh, positive cations and negative anions uh, in, in the system. And Although it's very easy to um, understand the electronic structure of these cations and anions when they're powering, separated, now when you mix these ions in a solid or liquid, even more in a liquid, um, what happens is that the, um, the electronic counterpart of the anion is stabilized by the presence of the cation, while the electronic counterpart of the cation is destabilized with respect to the uh, anion. So, so what's happening, uh, but, but the thing is, the, um, the actual energy shift, the relative energy shift of these different counterparts is actually quite difficult to predict. Here I am showing a uh, calculated spectrum for basically an inc increasing uh, uh, number of uh, ionic liquid pairs. And the interesting thing about these, uh, these spectra is that uh, you can see that if you fix everything relative to the HOMO of the valence band, and the HOMO is actually situated on the uh, anion in this case, you can see that when you increase the number of uh, ion pairs in the system, you have some parts of the valence band are shifting upward in energy. Well, if you look at the nature of these parts, these parts are actually found on the cation only. So what's happening here is that basically 
you, when you increase the size of the system you are uh, calculating, you shift uh, the cation electronic states upwards uh, with respect to the anion in energy. And this is basically uh, just witnesses the establishment of the magnum potential in the system. So now you can um, take this relative energy shift between cation and anions, and you can plot it as a function of uh, the number of pairs or the absence of pairs. So uh, <clears throat> zero being here, the uh, ions are very are separated far away, and here you increase the number of pairs. So what you see here is that once you increase, when you bring the ions together and increase the number of ions, uh, you basically have a convergence uh, to a stable energy shift for the system. And it turns out that the difference in energy between isolated ions and uh, the, the value you're getting for increasing number of pairs is uh, exactly twice the Madlum energy in the system. So basically, using photo emission, uh, you, valence band photo emission, you can measure experimentally this uh, Madlum energy. Uh, so this is uh, actually very useful because um, now you can start uh, extracting this Madlum energy by doing photo emission on different ionic liquids. In this particular case, uh, we've measured the uh, valence band spectra on different uh, on series of cyanoionic liquids where we keep the cation uh, the same, but we vary the anion. In particular, in this case, we vary the size of the anion. Um, and what we observe is that the uh, Madlum energy uh, is uh, actually decreasing as a function of the anion size. And this is uh, actually normal because, because you have a bulkier anion, you try to destab uh, destabilize the system. Uh, so you have uh, uh, less um, a cohesion in the system. So one of the interesting uh, parts is that the, um, we are here using valence band photoemission spectroscopy measuring electronic properties. But it turns out that these electronic properties have uh, repercussions on the physical properties, right? Because if you um, um, lose uh, a cohesion, um, you uh, uh, actually uh, also change the, some uh, physical properties of the, uh, of the ionic liquid. In particular, you can see that the uh, enthalpy of vaporization uh, actually scales with the Madlung energy. Uh, so it's an interesting case where you can correlate, uh, you can obtain uh, information from a valence band about physical properties. And um, Another important point is that because we can measure experimentally the um, uh, Madlung energy uh, using valence band photo emission, we can determine the uh, alignment between uh, the electronic states that are uh, due to the cation and the electronic states that are due to the, uh, um, to the anion. And this allows you to basically determine the homo lumo gap in the system. And this is quite important because uh, the homo lumo gap is actually uh, what is important when you consider electrochemical applications. And in fact, uh, what you're interested in when you use uh, uh, an ionic liquid as an electrolyte is you're interested in uh, knowing the windows uh, of the electrochemical window of stability for these, uh, for these materials. Uh, and in this case, using balance band photo emission, we have a predictive method for this electrochemical window. So uh, I'm going to stop here, and I just yeah, want to point out that yeah, balance band spectroscopy is a very powerful tool to study the electronic structure of these materials, but not only. And that if you want to know about a bit more about these systems, uh, you can uh, look at this uh, recently published paper. Well, thanks, Sylvie, for a really interesting presentation. It's fascinating the way that you can link the experimental work to the theoretical calculations. First question I have is really regarding the sample handling. Uh, we often get questions from customers about how to go about analysing liquids. So do you have any tips for people on how to mount the samples and generally how to deal with liquid samples? Uh, I guess the general tip is don't drop your liquid at the bottom of your UHV system. 
Uh, other than that, uh, as long as the uh, ionic liquid, uh, the, the liquid has a low enough vapor pressure, then uh, uh, you know it's not complicated. And and these particular ionic liquids have enough viscosity that uh, they will not spill everywhere on your system. Uh, but you do have to be careful about the reactivity of some of these liquids. Uh, for example, these cyanoionic liquids are very reactive with any oxides or things lying around. It would just grab oxygen from everywhere. You showed very nicely in the presentation how you managed to link a uh, physical property to the uh, spectral data that you'd collected. Um, have you tried to find any other properties that you could link to the uh, valence band spectra? Uh, no, we have not. Mm. But uh, you know, the, the ionic liquid community has been looking at these properties for a long time, and uh, indeed, uh, you know the. The in, basically, the, the, the nature of the ion, uh, ions, the, the nature of the uh, interaction between the ions is very relevant to define a lot of things like the, um, the viscosity of the ionic liquid or the, um, you know, the, the uh, enthalpy of vaporization and all the physical um, uh, properties of these materials. Obviously, the ionic liquid samples are conductive, so have you tried applying a voltage to the samples to see what happens during analysis? Um, well, we have uh, uh, we have goals of trying uh, something like that, uh, but uh, we're not there yet. So, uh, probably, soon. hopefully soon. <laughs> Well, that's really all we have time for today. If you'd like to see more of the work that they're doing at Rutgers or get in touch with the group there, you can contact them through the details that we're showing on the screen now. Thanks again, Sylvie, for uh, your time today and giving us a walk through your recent work. Well, thank you, guys. And thanks for watching this presentation today. We hope you enjoyed it and we look forward to seeing you again on our next video. Bye for now. Thanks for joining us for our interview with Sylvie. We hope you found it as interesting and informative as we did. If you want to see more content like this, you can find it on our website, xpssimplified.com. There you will find webinars on demand, app notes, and other resources like our new multi-technique infographic, as well as other information about all of our XPS and surface analysis products. This is the last video in this series of customer interviews. We hope you've enjoyed watching them. If you have any questions about any of the techniques you have seen, or XPS and surface analysis in general, you can contact our team using the email shown on screen. Thank you for watching.